Well, here we are again, Tampa fans. As of the recording of this video, our Bucks are five and seven and are just the Vikings who went away from officially being eliminated from playoff contention, making it 12 straight years that there's been no playoff football in Tampa, Florida. Now, when you look at this current five to seven season that the current version of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are having, there are several different things and several different fingers that can be pointed at various different positions. Let's talk about the offensive line that can't block. No, 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 no. Let's talk about the secondary that can't cover. No, no, wait, 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 I got it. Let's talk about the quarterback that can't stop turning the ball over. But I got it real good. How about we talk about the culture? You see, it's a very underrated thing and it's something that really matters here. The culture of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers has been losing. It is now and it's been for so long. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers franchise has been around for 43 years. They've made the playoffs 10 times. Out of all major league sports teams in America, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have 38.9% wins, which ranks second to last in all of professional sports. You didn't know this? Well, how about we add a lack of relevance to the never ending embarrassing list of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I call this series the sunken ships where I go back and I look and I analyze every embarrassing or painful or painfully close season the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have had from the playoffs. As I said before, this is the sunken ships. figure what better way to start the series, the sunken ships, than to talk about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers team that set sail on their season with extremely high expectations. And to start the season, met them, a team that had a chance to have a first round bye in the playoffs, their first 12 games. And a team that after a couple of struggles, still walked into week 17 with me in attendance to clinch a playoff game as long as they just beat Jamarcus Russell. How did that go again? And Michael Bush runs through them like a knife into hot butter. No, 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 cut it off, cut it off. We'll get to that later. If you haven't figured it out by now, this episode is about the 2008 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, in order to discuss this 2008 Tampa Bay Buccaneer team, I know it may be hard for some of you to believe, but this was not a team that came into the year with low expectations. This was not a team that came into the year hoping to surprise teams. These were the defending NFC South champions. This was a roster that was returning most of their team from the year prior. And in the year prior, yes, they got eliminated in the first round. But who did they get eliminated by? The Super Bowl champion New York Giants. So not necessarily the worst performance, correct? Tampa returned four to five starters of their own line. Those four being Jeremy Trueblood, Jeff Fain, Aaron Spears, and Donald Penn. The addition to their roster was Jeremy Zuta. At quarterback, the Bucks returned Jeff Garcia. And at running back, they got Cadillac Williams, who was coming back off IR the year prior, and even added Ward Dunn, a former Buck in the good old days before their Super Bowl. And he was on back on the team trying to make a run 
with this current Buccaneers roster. The Bucs also returned most of their receiving core, including Joey Galloway, a player who had led the team in receiving yard and added a valuable weapon, Antonio Bryant, who would go on this year to make great catches for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, an interesting tidbit that Bucks fans may not remember and non-Bucks fans may just not know is that how close Jeff Garcia came to not being the starting quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that season. That's right, in the offseason of 2008, the Green Bay Packers and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers came so close to completing a deal for the formerly retired Brett Favre, yes, that Brett Favre. And if you were to have watched some reports of NFL Network that night, the report said that the deal would have been done as soon as that Wednesday. And I'm talking about that this happened on a Sunday night. They even had Brett Favre's name in front of a Tampa Bay logo. So it looked like a done deal. It is reported that Buccaneers coaches went to a watering hole in Orlando, Florida, expecting the Brett, for Brett Favre to be their quarterback that year. However, with all this being said and done, at the end of the day, Brett Favre was traded to the Jets Tampa did not get the quarterback they wanted. Instead, they were left with the quarterback that they had, Jeff Garcia, the same quarterback who had taken them to the playoffs the year prior. I'm sure he didn't feel any type of way about how the Buccaneers coaches tried to do him that offseason. Now listen, it's important to note, this offense wasn't a group of world beaters. Like many teams under John Gruden, it was up and down all season. They had games where they scored 30. They had games where they scored in the 10s. But that was not the problem with this version of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The problem with this version of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, for one of the first times, but certainly not the last time, would be the defense. For the most part in the back seven, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers look the same, and if not the same, they at least look pretty sturdy. Guys like Quincy Black, Derrick Brooks, and Barrett Rue provided a pretty good linebacking core. Guys like Cato June from the Indianapolis Colts and Adam Hayward added on to make it a pretty deep group. In your secondary, there weren't too many holes there either. The team still had future Hall of Famer Rondé Barber, a good Tanar Jackson. Um, they had Akeet Tlaib, who was a rookie, but we all know how good Akeet Tlaib and how shut down he could be. It wasn't bad in the back seven. However, on the front line, things were questionable for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Bucs came into the season expecting guys like Gaines Adams, who was a top pick for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Chris Hovon, Kevin Carter, and Jovan Hay to be a big force up front. These were young, experienced guys that the Bucs were relying on, and I'm sure it didn't wind up hurting them in the future. So here we are, the stage is set for the 2008 season to get underway. A returning offense with a lot of veteran pieces and a, some young defensive players, but good enough and experienced enough that there shouldn't be too much concern. Plus, good old Monty Kiffin always seems to make things good. And the start of the Buccaneers season started exactly how many expected. Yes, the team lost a close game at New Orleans week one by a score of 20 to 24. The same New Orleans Saints who would go on to win the Super Bowl the very next year. However, after this loss, the Bucks would go on to win six of their eight games and their only two losses being at Denver and at Dallas by a combined seven points. Heading into the bye, this was a six and three team who was undefeated at home and showed that they could win close games on the road. Check the Chicago game and the Kansas City overtime games for proof of that. Jeff Garcia appeared to pay no mind to the clear disrespect John Gruden paid to him in the offseason. And the defense was suffocating, allowing 16 points per game in their first nine games. Yes, sir. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers were 6-3, second in their division, and had a playoff spot. And it seemed that, hey, with seven more games left to go, all was left to do was close out the season strong and get in the playoffs and start their Super Bowl run.
coming out of their bye in week 11, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers continued their season the same way that they went into their bye with, winning three of their first last seven games to close out the year, including a 38 point offensive spurt at Detroit. A winless Detroit, mind you. But a 38 point spurt nonetheless. After a huge win over division rival New Orleans Saints, I scored 23 to 20. The Bucks were tied for first in their division, owning the tiebreaker over the Carolina Panthers after an earlier season win, 27 to 3. And it appeared that nothing could stop them from making it to the playoffs and maybe even clinching a first round bye and home field advantage. And this, well, this is where things start to fall apart. Now listen, I wanna be very clear about what I'm about to say. What I'm hearing are rumors, reports. They weren't confirmed by Monty Kiffin. They weren't confirmed by John Gruden. They weren't denied by Monty Kiffin. They weren't denied by John Gruden. Neither one of them have spoken openly on this issue. With that being said, on November 28th, 2008, just two days before the Bucks' huge victory over the New Orleans Saints, Lane Kiffin agreed to be the head coach of the Tennessee Volunteers. Almost immediately, Lane Kiffin asked his father, Tampa Bay Buccaneers defensive coordinator, Monty Kiffin, to join his staff with him in Tennessee. Monty Kiffin agreed. Many Bucks fans may not remember Monty Kiffin's announcement to join the Tennessee Volunteers coaching staff until later on in the season. However, there is apparently a reason for this. Reports say that John Gruner refused to allow Monty Kiffin to announce his planned departure at the end of the season during the season. That's one thing, but the inexcusable part that may have led to the downfall of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers season this year was that Kiffin was not able to participate in normal coaching meetings. That's right, John Gruden apparently did not allow his defensive coordinator a man who's been there way before John Gruden got there, a man who helped with Tony Dungy create the Tampa 2 defense, was not allowed to participate in normal coaching meetings? Now, I'm going to state it one more time. Like I said, that's not confirmed. However, it's also not been denied. Both of these two have heard those rumors. You would think that if it wasn't true that some one of the two, at least John, would deny that rumor. And if it's true, what happens next? makes a whole bunch of sense. It was December 8, 2008. Two NFC South powerhouses colliding on Monday Night Football. Tied for first place. The winner of this game was likely going to win the division. These teams had already met before and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers held them to three points, dominated them at home. Now sure, this was on the road, but like I said before, Tampa has not budged on the road, they have been a good team all year, no matter where they have played. They've had one of the best defenses all year. Now this would be a close game, but surely if anything was to worry about, it would be about the offense, correct? Wrong. After a low scoring 10 to three first half in the favor of the Carolina Panthers, the Carolina Panthers, D'Angelo Williams and Jonathan Stewart proceeded to roll all over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense in the second half. And listen, it got bad in the second half. The Panthers got big run after big run after big run, soon pushing their lead to 31-17. That's when we got this great catch from Antonio Bryant. However, the kick was blocked to keep it at an eight point game. However, things were all good. All Tampa needed was one stop from their great deal. Yeah, that's right. The Bucks would go on to lose this game 38 to 23 and be a game behind Carolina in the division. Oh, okay, so what? They had a bad game, right? Whatever, they had the Falcons next. Now, just because it was on the road, that's fine. Surely, surely they weren't going to lose to another NFC South team that they dominated previously in the season, right? Right? This time it was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers' offenses turn to fail, only scoring 10 points the entire game and losing in overtime to the Atlanta Falcons by a score of 13 to 10. Okay, fine, we had two bad losses, but it can be argued that the NFC South was the hardest division in the NFL this year. We closed out our season with two AFC West teams, 
a division that put an eight and eight team in the playoffs. No way that we lose both of those games. By the way, by the way, who was that eight and eight team that made the playoffs out of that division? The Tampa Bay Buccaneers walked into week 16 still with the chance to clinch a playoff berth. All they had to do was beat a mediocre San Diego Chargers football team. However, in the fourth quarter, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense completely imploded, giving up 21 unanswered points in it. The Bucs watched the game slip away and were watching their playoff hopes slip with it. However, they still walked in to week 17 with a chance to make the playoffs. This is where things start to get very frustrating for the Buccaneers and quite embarrassing as well. It's one thing to lose to the Carolina Panthers who finished 12 and four. It's another thing to lose to the Atlanta Falcons who finished 11 and five. Heck, it's even another thing to lose to a San Diego Chargers team who went on a splurge to clinch their division and make the playoffs, even if it was at a lowly eight and eight record. But when you have Jamarcus Russell and the four and 11 Raiders coming to your house, you have to do your part to make the playoffs. The stakes were very simple for this year's Tampa Bay Buccaneers team. All they needed to do was defeat the Oakland Raiders and for the Philadelphia Eagles later on that day to defeat the Dallas Cowboys who were in a backslide of their own and they would be in the playoffs. Now, look, I could go on all day about this game given the fact that I was there and the general sense of a feeling around this team. Listen, I know that nowadays there's nothing but despair and low expectations for this team, but when we went to this game, when you talked to other Buccaneers fans at this game, it was a good sense in the air that we were going to win this game, the Eagles were going to beat the Cowboys, hey, <laughs> and we would be in the playoffs the very next week. But instead of me talking about what happened, how about you just watch a few of these clips? Jamarcus Russell to Zach Miller all kinds of times, 28 yards. Jamarcus, Jamarcus Russell to Tim Brown. Mm. Wait a minute. No, that's Chaz Schiller. Jamarcus Russell to Johnny Lee Higgins. This guy's become a receiver. He's a returner. He's doing it all for the Raiders. Cadillac Williams, a 39-yard run at the end of which a dreadful scenario ensues. Oh, it looked like wow. he just gave out. And that's the knee that he blew out last season and spent a year and a half rehabbing. It like he come just back. gave out. Oh, boy. And uh, he just knew on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Praying for you, Cadillac. Threw them like a knife into hot butter. 67 of his 177 rushing yards on the day. Raiders on top, Tom Cable, and the Raiders beat the Bucks in Tampa. As booze rained down on John Gruden in Raymond James Stadium, the season was over. Nothing could happen for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to get in. They had lost four straight, giving up over 30 points per game during that time period. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers completely collapsed. As if the loss to Jamarcus Russell, Tom Cable wasn't bad enough, as soon as you get home, you get home to seeing the Philadelphia Eagles completely wiping the floor with the Dallas Cowboys. And I'm telling you, man, John Gruden and that whole Tampa Bay Buccaneers staff and players need to be lucky that the New York Jets and Dallas Cowboys had their own epic collapses that year. But in my opinion, there was none worse than this Tampa Bay Buccaneers team. I mean, guys, this was a team that at the beginning of the year seemed like refused to be stopped from a goal in a Super Bowl run. This is a team that lost Joey Galloway early to an injury. And all they did was bounce back with Antonio Bryant right in his shoes. This was a team who managed to hold young, explosive offenses like the Carolina Panthers to three points, the Atlanta Falcons to nine points. And I know that we make a joke that, man, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers just find a way to lose. They do now. But during this season, it was the opposite. For the first 12 games, this team found a way to win. They found a way to win, and they just looked a complete shell of themselves. So what happened? Like I said before, we don't know if it's true. We don't know if it's false what happened with Monty Kiffin. But like I said before, if it's true, that's what I had to point to the most. 
38 points against the Panthers after you gave up three. 41 points against the San Diego Chargers. 31 points to Jamarcus Russell. This team did not look anything like the team that they had seen in the first 12 games of the year. And that falls squarely on John Gruden. And I think the Glazers recognize that. Not long after the 2008 season in January of 2009, John Gruden was fired. Obviously starting what would be a 10 year hiatus for John Gruden from the coaching game. And they would soon hire Raheem Morris. And there you have it, the 2008 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The end of this season will bring the Tampa Bay Buccaneers into a new era of football. Guys like Jeff Garcia, Derrick Brooks, Joey Galloway never played another down for this franchise. Cadillac Williams would stay on the team until 2010, but clearly got less and less carries as his career went on. Bruce Allen was fired after the 2008 season, which would soon bring in Mark Dominic and a whole new era of players and a whole new way for Tampa Bay. At the end of the day, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have only had two winning seasons since this 2008 season. And even though it fell short, there were some good moments and one of the last times that the Buccaneers had hope. However, it has definitely been a snowball effect since then. It's always now what can go wrong will go wrong, no matter how good it looks. This team was nine and three. Think about teams that are 9-3 and three in the NFL right now. Let's think about the Seahawks, who are 10-2. and two. Can you imagine them losing four straight? Can you imagine the Vikings losing out right now? Because that's what the Tampa Bay Buccaneers did. Imagine the Buffalo Bills losing out, missing the playoffs. That's what Tampa did. Just a complete, utter collapse. With that being said, it's time that we close the chapter on the 2008 Buccaneers. There are so many different seasons for us to harp on. And that's what I will do this series. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And as always, do me a favor and hit the notification bell if you're new. It's hard going through misery with this franchise. But as always, man, do me a favor. Stay smiling. Tampa Bay, that's where I reside. Say that shit with pride. Out my city, I'm the best alive. I can't even lie.